everything works here. Wireless. We don't have that in Netherlands. Okay, um, in advance, apologies for my bad jokes. It's something I cannot help. Just laugh if you think I'm making a joke. It helps me be more comfortable. Um, it's very nice to be here. It's the first time for Paul and me to be in Latvia. Uh, we really enjoy the weather uh, because we've had the worst spring since 1962. Um, so that's for me, that's the worst spring ever. Uh, and we like sunshine in Holland. Um, I will do two presentations, and the first one is about the Dutch Games Association. Um, I'm the chairman of the Dutch Games Association. I will explain a bit more about what it is that we do. Uh, but most of my time is spent on uh, Gamius, and I will give a presentation on Gamius after this uh, Dutch Games Association uh, presentation. So, um, a little bit about myself. I used to work, uh, work at Lycos. I don't know if you know Lycos. Lycos used to be a search engine before you had Google and, you know, actually good working search engines. Uh, Endemol, maybe you know Endemol. Endemol is the company that made Big Brother, the TV show. Do you know Big Brother? No? No one? Don't watch it, it's horrible. Uh, and Spill Games. Does anyone know Spill Games here? It's the biggest web game portal publisher in the world, they have a lot of web portals. <laughs> they reach about 150 million people every month with Flash games. So I know people at Spill Games. If you make Flash games, talk to me. I can introduce you to Spill Games and you know, perhaps we can, uh, can do business or I can introduce you to, uh, to the people there. Um, in general, um, I'm here to help you, so I will just give I, have, I, have, I know stuff about games. I'll tell you what we do. If you have a question, just please interrupt me because I like games, I like interaction, you know? So, um, yeah. About my street credibility, this is 1997. I used to be number one in the world with Warcraft 2, yes. Uh, that's my nickname, Pimster. Uh, so, if any, does anyone of you know Warcraft 2? No? Yes! <laughs> Finally, so this is I think this is what bonds us So if you really want to know stuff about something Ask me about Warcraft 2 because I can show you some nice peon orders and a way to get quick uh, bloodlust um, <coughs> This is what I used to do while I was studying but I wasn't really studying by playing Warcraft 2 I learned a lot about the games sector. I learned a lot about how communities work. I learned about a lot about you know That I wanted to make this thing my my profession Anyway, so what are the, the comparison between Latvia and Holland? I don't really know a lot about Latvia, but people, they tell about ice hockey. Well, both countries like to be on the ice at the same time and skate. So that's, that's great. Uh, Holland is, I think, the worst country in the world with ice hockey. Um, we play more football. Maybe you know Arjen Robbe. Uh, that's more our thing. Um, so yeah, so far the introduction. About the Dutch Games Association, I was just talking to, um, sorry, I've got <laughs> um, I asked her, do you have a, a brand organization for the games industry in Latvia? Do you, have you united uh, to, for example, uh, organize stuff together or speak as one voice to the government or to, to other sectors? Uh, I would advise you to do so. I hope this presentation will convince you of that. Um, we started this four years ago, and we are a sector organization. That means that uh, everyone involved in games uh, joins, so not just companies, but also governments, but also uh, and, and knowledge institutes like universities and schools. Uh, to have these three together, it's really nice, because then you can really make them work together, and, you know, if, uh, Educations talk to companies, then they know what they should educate <coughs> the, the students for. So, branch organization, 120 members. Um, we have a nice mission. We, we creating a healthy climate for the game sector. Well, the climate here, you, you're doing a better job, so you don't need uh, <laughs> a games organization. But we do uh, several stuff. So we we help entrepreneurs. We share knowledge. Uh, the strategic research agenda. We try to tell. Universities, what to um, 
uh, research, you know, on, on, on a games level. Um, valorization, does anyone know what it means? It means making money out of games. Uh, dissemination, research, get the research results across the world. Try to get, if, if a student did a PhD or something, uh, we need to uh, help him get that information to the company so they can perhaps use that information to start a company. Matchmaking, so we, you know, we try to bring together uh, companies to, to, to other uh, countries, uh, lobby to the government, and also in the media, uh, in Holland especially, maybe it's in your country as well, there's still a, quite a negative attitude about games. It's about all oh, games are addictive, uh, and what's the other one? Games are addictive. I'm looking at Paul. There's another one as well. Oh yeah, games are violent, so you, uh, if you play too many games, you start shooting people. Um, we think the other way around. We think that games are great because, and I'll show you a bit more in this, pres uh, in this presentation about the stuff some companies in Holland do. Uh, for once, gaming is a really cheap hobby. It helps people relax. I have a friend who is a surgeon in a hospital, and I talked to him, he, you know, he, he does heart uh, surgeries and stuff, and I was like, well, I'm in the games industry, and you're making people healthy. You know, and he was like, no, you are making people healthy, because when I used to run a platform, he said, well, like, more than millions of people are relaxing because of your games, and that prevents a lot of uh, heart disease. So we try to look at things uh, from a different perspective. Making the games ecosystem work, that, well, that was what I was just telling about, you know, making sure that companies, knowledge institutes, and the government work closely together to, you know, make a bigger international impact. Okay, about the Dutch game sector, some numbers. We have 330 companies, a lot of developers, and I think the, uh, I make an assumption, but uh, I think here you have more developers than publishers, probably a lot of small developers. We, we sort of have the same uh, distribution, I think. A um, couple of publishers, distributors, uh, one of them is Spill Games, which you don't know, but you know now, uh, and about 220 million revenues per year. So it's 3,000 3, jobs. It's not a big, uh, not a big sector, but it's, it's growing, and it, it has been growing for the past five years, I think. Um, and we've had, we are having a crisis right now, so the economy is going down, but the game sector has been growing against that crisis. So we're doing pretty well, but we can do a lot better. Um, some companies you may know, uh, Guerrilla, the, Guerrilla, does anyone know Guerrilla Killzone for the Sony PlayStation? Okay, that's like the only triple A, uh, you know, <laughs> have you played the game? Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, does anyone of you, of you know Flambeer? Yeah. yeah, so they're, I think they're the most famous indie developer. They have uh, released Ridiculous Fishing, I think, a month ago. Uh, Flambeer are like, I think, one of the most well-known indie developers in the world. They, you know, they go on a plane with Notch. You probably know Notch. Uh, interesting. So check Flambeer out. I think Flambeer is really good at helping other small developers on how to, you know, how to, to do business. Okay, what you don't know about, well, you know some companies here, but the, the companies you may not know is, for example, Ranji. They make serious games. Um, serious games or applied games, um, we make a distinction, I think I have it here. Um, the, the, the total business in Holland of gaming, it's not just entertainment games, it's more than half actually, it's about serious and applied games. So using a game to teach someone something, using a game to coach someone, using a game to, you know, help someone uh, get rid of some kind of uh, bad experience, a trauma. Um, Runch, for example, they made a game for a big uh, lawyer firm, and um, that game was about putting the, a potential candidate who wanted to work at that big law firm in a, in a position, in a simulation, and then let them just, by playing the game, and uh, they could figure out if that was the right person with the right skills to, to come up with a solution. Um, I think in general that's uh, what's, uh, what is great about games, that 
um, instead of like a, a book, which is, you know, you start at page one and page two, page three, uh, or, or a film where you just watch from second one to second 50, the, the interaction in game and the, the, the option for a player to, to choose what he wants to do and to reach a goal through his own uh, specific way, it's really great. So uh, the law firm um, actually trusts the game better, I think, than just a normal job interview where people can just say a lot of stuff, like I'm saying now. You don't have to believe me, but if you would let me play a game about making games, you, you, you would really see if I, you know, if you would let me play Warcraft 2 myself, I, you would see if I was good. I could just make up this thing, you know. I can also play, uh, I, could, I could have photoshopped this. But a play, if you let someone play a game, you can really validate his knowledge and see if he actually has some brains inside his head. Um, Feastep, another great example of, uh, of a serious or applied games uh, company. They used to make simulations for, uh, you know, you know these airplane simulation games, right? Um, and they made it for big ships. And it was an entertainment title, and the, the entertainment title did pretty well. But at one point, they were like, well, we are based in Rotterdam, which is a city in Holland, which is like a, a really big harbor. And uh, there's actually quite a really big need for uh, people to learn how to uh, control a big ship. And as you may uh, figure out that um, putting someone in a simulation, in a game simulation, is a lot cheaper than, you know, letting him experiment in a big ship. If the ship breaks and it comes, you know, it's, it's, it's a mess. So they, they make really uh, high level simulations. Uh, they sell that all over the world. And the, you know, the, 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 the game technology itself, it's not really, really advanced, but it's just a good game. But they, they offer all these companies a really cheap way to, to teach and train people to be on board, to, 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 you know, to, to maneuver a ship. Um, and because it's a game, you get intrinsic motivation. So it's f actually fun to, um, to do it. So um, when you look at the, the, the difference between entertainment and applied gaming, of course, you have different customers. Um, the market is different. So um, for entertainment, title, of course, you, when you make a title and it's, I don't know, shooting a bird who's angry, you know, not a lot of translation needed, and you put it in the App Store, and you know, uh, but applied gaming is usually for one uh, company who says, please build this game for me. Um, but the advantage of applied gaming is you get money right away. It's obviously, obviously a problem for a lot of small studios who want to you know, make the game and make a hit right away. If you can find a nice solution and you can offer a game for a business and help them uh, do, do better business by using games, you can earn money and maybe spend half of your time on projects like these and half of the time on developing an entertainment game to make the next Angry Birds. Um, and what is really important is that uh, as long as you make that serious or applied game, as long as you make it fun, it, it's the same craft. It's, it's, you know, you, you may think, and I used to think that making serious games or applied games are not fun because you have this company and they want a game. Um, just try to always make a fun game because if the game is not fun, the applied game or the serious game will not be successful. And then if you don't have a successful solution for that client, he will not come back and give you more money. And money is good, I think. So about the, the strength of the Dutch games industry, I think we're quite creative, uh, out of the box thinkers. Um, we are used to making products that you know, travel the world, even if the products are not very good, like Heineken beer. I, we, we still do a pretty good uh, job in, uh, in the marketing. Um, we have a really strong indie games uh, community. Like I said, Flambeer is an example. And um, we are also a, uh, yeah, one of the leaders in applied gaming. So we are really known for using games as a medium to, like I just said, to offer new solutions, better solutions for other, for the, the, the old learning uh, 
methods. And what we don't have is production power. We, we are not India. We don't have 165 billion uh, programmers. Uh, so we, we really have to be creative and uh, do it. We, we're, we're just not very big. Um, so we're still vulnerable. vulnerable. We don't have the a big enough size yet, so a lot of small companies are, companies are still struggling, um, but we're growing. Um, just wanted to show you an example of an applied gaming case, and I'm, I'm not here to promote applied gaming, but it's, it's just a really nice example of a mix between applied gaming and an entertainment game. Um, this is a company called Cutting Edge Games, or Grendel Games. Um, there is this thing called laparoscopic surgery. It took me three years to pronounce it correctly. And laparoscopic surgery, you will see it on the picture on the right. It's surgery that is done in the stomach where the surgeon cannot see what he's doing. So um, it doesn't really matter how... Uh, it's, it's, it's the, the surgeon needs to do things that he cannot see. So eye-hand coordination is not really there. Um, they, they inject some kind of needle under the belly and they have to control uh, the, the, I don't, <laughs> don't know what you call them, but they have to control the equipment and they have to operate the patient inside the body. And the main skill that you have to learn there is just, you know, being really good at controls, you know, at, at uh, uh, at controlling the, the, the tools. Um, they built a special lab in a city called Groningen, which is really nice to pronounce. Uh, and that lab cost six million uh, euros to, bu to, to build. And in that lab, it's like uh, a room this size, they try to perfectly imitate the, the operation room, the, like the environment with the same tools. And um, so they could simulate the, the operations. And the result was that no one came there because the students didn't find it fun at all to, to train there. And um, they were, you know, it was like, I'm not going to say they wasted six million, but it was just not very effic uh, efficient. So what this game company did, they uh, rebuilt a, a, a Wii controller and they made uh, the same controls as the, the operation uh, kit. And um, they forgot about all about the, present, about the, the operation uh, itself. And they just made an entertainment game. And if you see, that's like the, the thing that he's playing on the top right uh, picture. It has nothing to do with the operation, but it's a fun game where you are, you are a robot and you have to pick up stuff, but you have to use the exact same controls. Um, a fun game, all the students started playing the game and everyone started competing against each other. So uh, instead of six million, I think, uh, you know, the price of Nintendo, it's going down and down. But it was so much more, uh, uh, it was not expensive at all to make this solution. And a lot more students played this and they compared the skills um, of the students who play this game to professional surgeons, and they have tools for that, and the skills were validated, so they were the same. So the game actually had a really good effect on the, the, the surgeon skills of the students. So I think it's a really fun example, and I think games can be used for much more things than just this, and we need uh, more examples like these to open up people's eyes about what games can do. That's good because that will grow our business and it will may be interesting for you as well to, to, to do this. Um, yeah, like I said, and I think the, the, someone else said it before, the game's future looks really bright, I think. More platforms, more players, and more, more applications, more usages for, for games. And um, yeah, you can use it for, for all kinds of things. Um, now I'm just going to say s stuff about Holland, not really there's no really a presentation flow, so to speak. Just some background information. If you have any questions, just let me know. This is the, 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 the amount. Of, this, is, this is Holland, by the way. Uh, uh, we have about 32, I think, 35 educations about games. Um, 
you know, a lot of different things she can study for, game artists, game design, playful interaction, etc. So we've quite a big number of people that are going to graduate quite soon and we they all want to have uh, they all want to work in the game sector so it's going to be a challenge to to grow our business fast enough to to make sure they all have a job um, the Dutch game sector uh, we organize uh, Holland uh, pavilions so you probably know the gamescom uh, convention um, so together we we collect money and we organize this pavilion. It's really good to do business because that's where all the international uh, uh, companies come. We do this in Germany, in GDC and in the USA and also uh, other uh, conventions in, in Germany. We also have the Dutch Game Garden and um, Dutch Game Garden is sort of like an incubator. Uh, it's, it's one big building and you're only allowed in that building if you're a game company and if you have a lot of potential as a game company. So in this building, it's in Utrecht. Uh, it's, it's the city in the middle. The pizza city, I think, with all the pies. Uh, pizza pieces, slices. Um, and that's nice. Uh, there's 30 companies in there and they all... Um, you know, they're small companies, but they all share a lot of, you know, experiences, knowledge, um, and it's really successful. So Flambeer is in there, but also maybe, you know, uh, Ronnie Moe Studios, um, they have the, what's the name, uh, Awesome Nuts, uh, their game, it's, it's uh, well, some of you know it. And it, you really see that it helps have all these young startups, developers in one building, you get this learning uh, effect. So if you have an empty building somewhere here in uh, this city, maybe you can just say, Let, let's all sit together in this and, and, and learn and, uh, and help each other. Um, another thing we have, don't know if you have it here, it's a company called uh, Control, and they are um, sort of like the, sp the spokesperson for the game sector. This is a community, they, they have a magazine, they have a website, and they, the only thing they do is report about the Dutch game sector. If a company has a new game out, if, if you're looking for a job in the game sector, um, opinions. Um, they even have a monthly talk show. So um, that's the bottom picture, that's a talk show. And the only people who come there are uh, in the game sector. So there are a lot of topics. So one night they will have a topic about I don't know, uh, PR of games, one time they will have something about, you know, just several subjects about gaming. Um, and that's also a, a, a nice example of, uh, of what we do here in Holland. Um, yeah, this is a really quick introduction to, uh, to the Dutch game sector. Um, and I have a presentation after this, and I'm still on schedule, right? A <laughs> little bit too late, but... Uh, yeah, but we started later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but if anybody has a question, so I can give it a mic. Hi. Hi. Ah, okay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, about... Uh, you show this uh, triangle where the company, government, institutions, and the knowledge institutes. Uh, yeah. The first one. Uh, I'd like to ask about this government part. Uh, do you have any kind of uh, government support programs or a special? Uh, because uh, some years ago we had media media workshop here, and uh, guys from European Game Developer Association told that they had a good lobby in Brussels, and now they have part of financial going through media comes directly to game development. Do you have kind of programs or supporting stuff from government here? And what about education? If education is your initiative, I mean, uh, from companies' point of view, or it's governmental programs? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, um, an example, uh, the Dutch Game Garden is uh, supported by uh, the European Union. European Union. Uh, and uh, for the Dutch game sector, they uh, support us if we want to organize uh, the Holland Pavilion on the, you know, the, the, the big game conventions. Uh, and they also help us on um, what I said here, and it's a bit too in-depth perhaps, but uh, the, the, the game's ecosystem in making it work. So we, we had a very 
fairly good lobby to the government where we said things like this, you know, uh, this is what games can do, where's the example? This is what games can do. We are in the forefront of, you know, applied gaming. There's a lot of economic potential in games. So please, Mr. Government, help us, um, you know, be more advanced there and help us to, to grow this business because it's international business. It's, it's, it's one of the things that we are good at. We're creative. We know how to ship things internationally. We're, you know, sort of innovative. Um, so we, we, we needed to convince the government that gaming was a, a, a sector with a lot of potential. <clears throat> and it costs a lot of time and money and frustration. Um, but they are helping us more and more, and they're helping us now to, to make sure that companies and knowledge institutes work better together, uh, that we can sort of promote gaming to other businesses, and uh, yeah, just different things. Do you have any special tax policy, maybe? No? Um, no, so there's some practice about filming. Yeah, or yeah, but I know what you mean. The, 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 it's not like they are like, oh, you're a games company, here's money, have fun. So it really needs to be um, uh, in line or aligned with the, the government's policy of growing the, the, the games economy. So we, the, we have a tax, and you're probably more knowledgeable about, about it, but you can go to the government to get a tax cut on salary costs if you are if you can prove that you're doing innovative technical stuff. So that's an example. Um, yeah, so, but it's not like uh, the government has a big bucket of money and all oh, games, here you go, <laughs> bring bags. So it's not like that. So does somebody has uh, more questions? If not, I have two simple questions. Uh, first one, uh, what is the salary for a game developer in Netherlands? And second, uh, what kind of games are, uh, are are you making the most? Like all of them, or, or more mobile, or social, or mm -hmm. um, the salary is three million now. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I think if you have a, a, a fixed salary, like a steady job, uh, then it's probably around fifty thousand euros, and. Um, that's like a, a fairly, well, I think, a decent salary, especially in the games market. Um, but I think most companies, they, 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 you know, they're entrepreneurs, and um, they just need money to pay the rent and to buy food and also some drinks, and you know, buy a Unity license. So, so the, the average, I think, the average salary of all these 3,000 people, because there's a lot of freelancers, etc is lower than like the normal salary if you have a, a fixed contract. Okay. No other questions about my salary? How about uh, what kind of games uh, are... Oh, sorry. Um, I think the <coughs> entertainment uh, market, most of them are all going to uh, iOS, Android, smartphones, tablets, some of them Facebook. Um, and it used to be more Flash games. So we have a pretty strong, like I said, Spill Games, the company that none of you know, but uh, pretty strong flash gaming uh, uh, background. Um, and for series games, it really uh, depends on uh, what the customer wants. But I think it's also shifting to, to what the consumer uses, like tablets and mm -hmm. uh, normal computers. But you had a question? Sorry, could you repeat it? Is the contract in contract based employment popular in Netherlands? Contract, so like uh, you get a fixed fee for do doing one project. Yeah, yeah it's, it's popular, yeah. And I think it's more and more going in that, that, that direction where companies say, here's, please make this game. This is the amount of money that we have for you. This is the budget. And if, you, if you know, if you don't succeed in time, then that's your problem. Uh, the game needs to be finished for that amount of money. So, yeah. You, sorry, no, you mentioned that you are a type of specialist in the Netherlands. And uh, are you uh, taking advantage of some outsourcing facilities? For example, outsourcing some work to the USA or other 
Yeah, well, it, yeah, we. Um, I think every game development. Uh, I think your question was, do we have any experience with outsourcing, and is there any demand for Holland to outsource to, for example, Latvia? That's your question, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there is. Um, I think every game company in Holland has experience with outsourcing a project. I think mostly to India. They were not really happy about that uh, cooperation because uh, I don't know. Maybe it's the curry, uh, but. I think uh, first they went offshore, like India, China, and now it's more popular to go nearshore. And you know, like Latvia, Holland, it's, the, the time difference is it's, it's much uh, smaller than India, China. It's, that's a huge advantage. So I would definitely, uh, you know, let me know, and I can just give you uh, a list of companies, and you can mail them and tell them that you can do outsourcing things. Okay, I think the last question, and then we can proceed. <laughs> also from uh, just uh, one more question about outsourcing. Uh, is, uh, is really English language uh, so widely supported in Netherlands, so it could be used on a daily basis? For example, if you are having some outsourcing contracts with Latvia or some other countries, uh, do you use uh, always English language in your communications? Yes, yes, because if we use Dutch, then you're not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Same for Latvian. I would like to speak English, but it doesn't work. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Holland, we, we are a small country. Uh, no one is going to learn our language. So we, most of the Dutch people, they speak French, German, and English to be able to communicate with our neighboring countries. But English, everyone speaks English quite well. Okay, so I think we can proceed to the next presentation. Yep. You perhaps have a glass of water because I'm talking way too much. Um, so, um, switch. That was previous presentation was me from my Dutch Games Association, association role. Uh, this is from um, uh, my own company or my own company. It's together with my twin brother and some other people. So, if you see someone looking like me, it could be my twin brother. Uh, don't start hugging him right away. I know you, but uh, so this is about Gamius. Uh, and we're the collaborative games company. Uh, this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to speed it up quite a bit. <laughs> this is where I worked. Oh, this is about me. This is the most important stuff. Uh, and uh, we, with Gamies, we have a thing called the Game Train. And I will, I will explain you a little bit about the Game Train, but uh, why did we start the Game Train? It's really simple. Uh, I was quite successful with other companies, and then I wanted to start my own company, a really big publisher. And we needed millions, so we of course went to investors, and they, so they said, "No, Pim, you cannot have millions." And it, uh, it just took too long, and we were talking, tired of talking to investors, and we were like, "Let's just start instead of, you know, trying to get money." So, what is the game train? It's um, collaborative game development for well, B2C business to consumers and business to business. That's like the entertainment games and uh, uh, business games. And we uh, assemble teams around hit potential concepts. So we think we know which game format or game concept could be a, a really big hit. Um, and you just need a couple of people to build that game. And we uh, ask them to join the project. And um, we build the game together. Everyone works from their own office or their own uh, bathroom. And um, we, as soon as the game is published uh, or finished, we publish it, and everyone gets a share of the revenues. Um, so that's it. Um, this is the website. You can check out the different projects. If you like the project, you can click on a wagon, because every train wagon stands for a specific role we need, from developer to game artist to game designer. Um, you can join the project if we like you, and then we start the project, and uh, yeah. Uh, and then we make really successful games. Uh, who do we work with? V really diverse, from freelancers to real game studios to uh, just students who have uh, spare time. Um, and we've built, quite, built up quite a big database of people who are helping us. And why do we think this is a, 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 a nice 
uh, method of working with people because we believe that in order to make a good game, you need to have the right people on the right project. So if we're going to make a real-time strategy game, uh, I don't really believe that one studio can make a great real-time strategy game and a great 3D shooter and a great casual game. You really need people who love that specific genre, I think, that specific game title. Then they'll have the passion and, that, and the skills and the knowledge, etc. And uh, I think there's, if you have a team that's really passionate about a game, that's where you make that little bit of extra quality in a game. And that's where you have a bigger chance of success. Um, we are a publisher, but we are really uh, involved in the production process of the game. So we really like to be there from the start till the end. I'll show you a little bit about the process later on. Um, I was talking about hit potential. Um, we don't start Me Too projects. So if Angry Birds is really successful, we're not going to make angry dogs or angry cats. We, we don't think that you have the ultimate hit potential there. I think players are always looking for something new, something that they haven't played before. It, of course, needs to be original. It needs to be accessible. You know, it doesn't need to be too complicated. Um, yeah, so we always try to look for something new. Uh, file factor. If the game is fun enough, you will, you know, marketing is, of course, important. But if the game is really a hit, you tell someone, look, I just played this game. You have to play it, too. Um, and if you can build in some, like, mechanics in that game, you probably all know Candy Crush. It's really good at you know, getting you to invite other people to, uh, to help you in a game, but it also helps to, to get more players. Um, that's important. And we also really do a good check on if we think we have a new Angry Birds, uh, we check, OK, what does the market look like? What is the target audience? What is this, this theme going to be, be like? I mean, if it's a game suited for, for women, you probably go, well, you don't go with the hard rock, uh, heavy metal, uh, cars, soccer, football, ice hockey theme, but you probably go for something different. Um, so us as a publisher, we have a pretty good feel with the market. And you know, working together with the developers, we think that's really important. And we, we, we have a multi-platform strategy, so we, we focus on um, yeah, all the modern platforms. Okay, so how does it work? Or what does the, you know, the, the basic workflow process look like? It all starts with a game concept. And a game concept, everyone can have a good idea for a game. I mean, you've probably told, or when you've spoken to other people that you're in the games business, I'm quite sure that they've told you, that they've interrupted your conversation and they said, oh, but I have a really good idea for a game as well. And they start talking about it. And that's really easy to have an idea for a game. But the real um, test if that idea is really fun or not is in the prototype stage. So that's why you try to make a prototype uh, based on that game idea and try to iterate it and redevelop uh, to, to prove if it's actually a fun game or not. If it's not, if it's no fun, then we were wrong, and then we just stopped the project. If it is fun, then we go, you know, then we really start the game train. We, we start looking for the right people, and then we just uh, uh, start uh, developing the game. Um, we have a, a lawyer in Holland, uh, and his specialty is uh, games and IP and publishing, etc. Um, and we've also asked him to help us with this game train platform. So. Um, we have pretty good contracts with everyone helping with these, uh, with, with these projects. So all legal stuff about IP and about you know, how much percentage of the revenues you get, it's all you know, uh, properly organized. Um, so everyone gets on a team, uh, sign a contract. Uh, then we go through the development cycles. And then we do the launch, marketing, distribution, etc. It's a lot of fun. Um, we really try to keep these game trains on track. 
Um, as you may know, uh, as soon as you're developing a game, you're like, oh, this is really fun, and maybe the bananas should fall from the sky as well, and you can explode, and you, you, know, you, you add more and more features, and the scope gets this wide, and you know, then the, the game will not be finished in, in 10 years. So we really try to make the project not last too long. We, uh, so we have a pretty good producer on every project. Um, and we also make sure that the, the core game concept isn't lost. So sometimes you start building a game and you and it sort of shifts in the wrong direction. And it's really important to, to keep that core game idea, that core focus. Because otherwise you get like a, a game that doesn't really appeal to anyone anymore. Um, so about making money in the game, it's really important. Um, in the old days, it used to be, well, let's just make a game, and it, you know, it ends up in the in the store, and you know, people go to the cash register and they pay money. Right now, it's completely different. You need to have monetization, marketing, viral options, etc. It all needs to be in the game. We need to think of it during development. Um, and don't know, does anyone know ROI, return on investment, uh, ARPU, average revenue per user? That stuff is really important because um, if you know how much money you're going to make on average from a game use, from a, from a player, for example, if that's 10 euros, that's like one of the most important things to know. <clears throat> because if you know that you make 10 euros out of a player, you can spend like five, six, or seven euros on marketing to get more players in. And if, if that little money-making machine works, then that's uh, really important. But you need to have all the subtle monetization things in the game. Needs, they, they need to be uh, really good, nicely configured. In order to do that, you need to have good analytics. So you need to measure what happens in the game where do people, why do 90% of the people stop playing level 12? Maybe level 12 is just too difficult. Why cannot, why can't they play level 13 if they cannot make, if, they, if level 12 is too difficult? You know, stuff like that. If you really know where the people are in your game, uh, how many people, you know, all these conversion steps to, from level to level, from uh, do they visit the, buy something page, uh, can we test which user interface works best? It's, it's a process that you constantly need, to, constantly need to optimize after the launch of the game. And that's something that we do as well, of course. Okay. We haven't started this, well, we're not, we're about two years old, the company. Um, we have about 13 game train projects uh, uh, in progress. Uh, two games are uh, released. I'll show you one of them and I'll show you also one of them which is about to be released. We have about 300 people in the database, about 75 people who are working with our projects. Um, like I said, we have the legal framework in place so it's really easy to uh, to make nice arrangements. And um, maybe most important is that we've learned the right lessons. So um, our first projects, based on this game, tra game train concept, the first projects, they failed miserably. And um, we're really happy, well, I'm, now I'm lying, but it, it, we learned a lot of lessons there because we, we knew what, what worked, what didn't work, and how can we improve this. So um, the nice thing is that the games that are already released, the, the, the teams that were uh, on uh, or participating on that project, they are doing a new project with us. And in the end, that's most important for us, that we have good games, that we have happy teams, that we make money with the games, because that way more and more people can, can join our uh, game trains. Sort of a competitive thing about, okay, what makes us different from other publishers? Um, other publishers, they have all these people uh, on the payroll, and like I just said, uh, 50,000 euros is a lot of money. Uh, 
and it's just expensive to, to have people on the payroll. And it's, it sounds a bit harsh, perhaps, but I prefer to have as little people on the payroll as possible, well, unless I make enough money, of course, but you just try to keep the costs down, especially in this new economy where more things are you know, sharing risks, more project-based work. Um, and um, because we don't have like, our own development team, uh, it enables us to be really flexible. So, you know, if if you have like ten Unity experts on your team, and all of a sudden Unity isn't allowed in App Store anymore, or just giving a really bad example, then they're still on your payroll. And we, you know, we could be like, well, you know, we'll see you in half a year when you've studied another programming language, uh, but we will now go on with this team and they know RTS better, or they know another game better. So we're really flexible. Um, write people in our projects, and um, yeah, what we think is also really important is that um, publishers that have, or developers that have a lot of people on the payroll, they also tend to uh, not take too many risks. And so they make, they copy other game concepts, and. It's just not very exciting, so we, we try to do new stuff. Um, yeah, the disruptive model, I think we're the first company to really focus on these kinds of uh, uh, collaborations. I'm not sure, but we are one of the first, and that's nice to know. Okay, so BrickWit is uh, it's a fun game, I think. Uh, it looks a bit like Where's My Water, of course. You may know the mechanic. Um, but this is really for the more advanced puzzler uh, player. Uh, it's really challenging. You have to really, uh, you know, puzzle. Um, it was launched in February, and it was the first relaunch of the game. And we were, it was quite a successful launch if you look at the amount of media attention that we got. You probably know IGN, the website, you know, they did a big uh, thing on us. Uh, uh, quite, we, we received a lot of good reviews, like four or five stars. Um, IGN even did a video about our game, and uh, what we noticed is that you know you get all that media attention. You know, combined, I think a million. We received a million followers on Twitter. In theory, could have read about our game, but it hardly did anything to the to the sales uh, of the game itself in the App Store. So. Uh, you know, that's a nice lesson to learn, that in order to get the real results, you probably need to be on the iPad itself, you know. And IGN, it's a great website, but it hardly did anything for our game sales. So apparently these people read about the game, and the iPad is just too far away, or it's just, they, they're, they're not really in that, you know, one click away from the game. So that's a nice lesson that we've learned. So in the future, we will just spend much more time on marketing and distribution in the game itself. Uh, Brickwood will be in China soon. It will be in Japan soon. Um, of course, the games will be launched in the App Store and, and, and Google Play. But we also try to increase our, uh, or to grow a distribution network. So to find local partners in countries where we really don't understand the market. Um, for example, China. I don't really speak Chinese well, not at all. Um, but we found a partner in China who has access to a lot of people, uh, like hundreds of millions of players. Uh, and they help us localize the game, to translate the game, and they apply their own business model uh, um, where the, the Chinese people are used to a certain way of paying for games. Um, so it's really nice to do your own launch, but also to build up the distribution network in countries where other publishers, local publishers, have a lot more knowledge about making a game successful there. So it will be in China soon. It's going to be interesting. Um, another game, and this is not the final art, but just fun to show you. They're both not really, as you can probably see, they're not huge titles. It's not like Call of Duty. They're small, casual games. And this is a fun thing about, um, well, does anyone of you know the Global Game Jam? Yeah? OK, great. Um, last year, there was a Global Game Jam. And if you, you, know, you 
it's one weekend in all these hundreds of locations in the world, people get together and they spend one weekend on building a game. And they hardly, uh, hardly get any sleep. And at the beginning of the Global Game Jam on Friday, uh, all the people get together and they, you're, they, they form teams. And uh, this game, uh, the team that made this game, or all made the prototype for this game, they were all programmers and really introverts and they didn't really like talking to people. So after like 200 people had all formed their teams, there were like four people left in the room and they were like looking at each other, okay, so I guess we're a team. Um, but there were also a lot of pre prefab teams and people that you know had sort of decided, okay, let's go to the, to the global, global game jam and we, we, we have our team already assembled. So this team, they got together and they made this game in Unity, for Unity programmers, and we really, we really liked the, the concept. The only thing you can do is move the ball from left to right and make it bigger or smaller. And the bigger your ball is, the heavier it is. So you can think of all these fun mechanics. Um, that game will be out probably within two months and we hope to get it on Steam uh, and we hope that they will feature it and we hope that millions of people will download it. Um, where was I? Yeah, I tried to incorporate the, the, the movie in PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm almost um, at the end. This is just an example of uh, a game that we're doing for the Dutch dairy industry. And um, another nice example of a uh, applied game. The Dutch dairy industry has a problem with their image um, because people in Holland think that the cows have a really bad life uh, and that they are uh, grown in horrible conditions and that you know, all, all these things. Um, but the reality is different. Uh, the stables, you have like these really advanced stables where the cows can you know, go anywhere they want. And as soon as they feel like, oh, I need to, you know, I've got a lot, I need to get rid of my milk, they walk into a so-called milk robot, which is a small building inside the, the stables. And the milk robot uh, identifies the cow and he knows, okay, so this is cow. I don't know, don't know what a Latvian typical cow name is, but let's call her Rita or something. Uh, so this is Rita 31, and this is her age, and oh, she needs this much food, and she will you know, get some special food, and maybe she needs some extra medication as well. Um, and then she gets the proper amount of food. While she's eating, she's being milked, uh, milked so a laser is sort of uh, you know, connecting her to, to the milk uh, robot. Um, and if another cow, for example, goes to the milk robot and the, the robot recognizes that cow, um, and the robot can also see, okay, you've, you've been here one hour earlier, you're not allowed, you, you cannot get any more food, so the cow just gets uh, denied, and then sort of, it, it's pushed out of the barn, and you know, it's, it's really funny. I've been there, I saw a cow getting denied of being milked. Um, Anyway, how can we improve the image of this? How can we show this to, to people uh, that the conditions of these cows? I mean, I've been in that stables and it's, it's one of the most relaxing ex uh, experiences I've had this year to be there and to see just these cows having a really nice, relaxed life. Oh, you know, I feel like eating and milk. I'll just you know, slowly walk into the thing, I get milked. Oh, I'm gonna go outside. All the activities also measured. Um, so how can we show that to, to, the, to the real life, to the, to the large audience? Um, we connected the 
cow technology data to a game, and we made it into, or we're gonna make it into a uh, sort of like a competition manager. I don't know if you know these games where you get to pick, for example, ice hockey players, and you can predict who's gonna make most goals or who's gonna make most saves. Don't know if you know that type of game. Or if you don't know, then you probably not get the real, uh, the, the, the perfect idea of what the game will be like. But um, the people will get to predict, they get to select their own cows, and they need to predict how much milk uh, they're gonna produce every day, and they can you know, follow their own cows on Twitter. They're gonna be, there's gonna be webcams inside of the stables. And um, yeah, we hope that we're gonna make these cows really famous. And if these players play the game, they, they have a reason to play the game because it's fun. But in the meantime, they will learn, you know, by accident almost, that life of these cows uh, is actually quite, you know, it's, it's a better life than they have, you know? It's the, so, um, and this is a work for hire uh, uh, project. Um, we checked our database and we sort of remembered that on one of the resumes of, the, of one of our developers was that he was the son of a uh, cow farmer. Um, and so we happened to find three, I think they're the only three developers who have fathers that are cow farmers, but these three guys are building this game. So we didn't need to explain it to them at all. So it's a really big coincidence, but it's a really nice example of how we are able to find the right people with the right passion and the right knowledge on the right project. So, Kuyen spell Ku means cow, but you probably already guessed that. Um, a little bit about, about the potential. We think the game train has a lot of potential. Uh, why not? Because as long as we are able to run these projects and make them successful, we're open to, uh, to work together with anyone. Um, and we're really transparent about things. For example, about the revenue share you get uh, the entire team knows what the other developers in the project get. So, um, and there's no complaints usually. Um, so why not become the standard for such types of uh, uh, projects and collaborative, collaborative game development? Okay, um, that's it. Any questions, you want to work with us? Do you need any tips, etc. Uh, let me know. Am I in time? Yeah, sort of. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, some the numbers, cows. obviously. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to ask you is, what are average budget, team size, and time frame for development of a standard casual game aiming at 50,000 per platform in yeah. your experience? I Thank think uh, the average time to develop a game is a bit longer because mostly uh, people do not do this full time because they need to earn money uh, as well because they take a little bit of a risk of course. I think the average team size is about five to six people. So a producer, a game designer, an artist, a developer, um, some level design and maybe some user interface, sound design. Um, so the average, that's like the average team size. Uh, what we try now is to finish the game within uh, like six to nine months. Uh, and we're sort of doing a, we're, we're, we're increasing the time of the development of, of a game. Um, one of the lessons that we've learned that in the beginning we first assembled the entire team and then we started development and now we just start with one developer and just prototype with him until the game concept is validated and, and until it's fun. And then we start the project and then we, you know, as soon as all the game mechanics and stuff are ready, then we get the artist and, you know, sound composer at the end. So the overall time is probably six to nine months, but we hope that the time for the specific game train passenger, so to speak, is shorter than that. And it's part-time as well. And what we've also learned is that um, we, some, some games we make have uh, are puzzle games or have levels. Uh, we always want to have a level editor so we can invite like 10 or 20 people to build levels for us. For example, for Brickwit, I could explain someone in one minute, well, it's not really complicated to build levels in that game. 
but anyone can make can make levels and um, because you have uh, a large group of people making levels you get a really nice level variety so you get not uh, yeah a lot of different levels so okay if we don't have any question uh, uh, what technology are you using do you have something in build or you use unity or yeah I think most of our games are in Unity. Um, we also have some projects in Game Maker. I don't know if you know Game Maker. Anyone? Yeah. Um, that's nice because you know you can export it to iOS and Android, etc. Uh, and some are in native language like C or Java. Also HTML5. Sorry. HTML5. Also yeah, yeah, Android. yeah. And Game Maker can also export to HTML5. Mm -hmm. But HTML5 is still a bit, uh, you know, it's, it's not there yet, so to speak. But yeah, so we're really open to any uh, uh, kind of uh, programming language. But it helps if it's in Unity because it's just easier to 